Chapter 151 The War Sunday, 2nd of July, 1978 Hurry up, Potter! Remus hammered on the glass and the door of the phone box. Other people need to make phone calls, you know. James rather rudely turned his back, hunching his shoulders and speaking furtively into the receiver. Leave him be, Mooney, Sirius murmured, leaning heavily on the fence. He was wearing very dark sunglasses and looked paler than normal. And stop all the banging, will you? Take another pain-killing draught, Remus tutted. You're just hung over. It's your own fault for getting so smashed. I was the life and soul, I'll have you know, Sirius retorted, folding his arms as Remus came to sit beside him. The Potters had hosted the end-of-school party the night before, for all Hogwarts leavers and their friends. Yaz and Chris had come, even though they both had another year to go. A few members of the Order of the Phoenix were there, too. No Dumbledore, but Ferox and Moody and Frank Longbottom, and his pretty blonde girlfriend, now fiancé, apparently. Moody had called Remus over to them a few times, only to be intercepted by Mrs. Potter. "'It's his school leavers' party, Alistair,' she hissed after the fourth time. "'Let him enjoy himself for five minutes before forming a flipping war council.' She said this so sharply that they desisted. Remus was a bit shocked, too. That's the closest he'd ever heard Mrs. Potter come to swearing. The rest of the party had felt just like the Gryffindor common room, while at the same time feeling nothing like the Gryffindor common room. Remus tried not to be so sad. He tried to imagine that one day he would find something else that felt as much like home as Hogwarts had. Lily, Mary and Marlene all had to leave at midnight. They'd promised their parents they'd spend the night at Lily's. Apparently their families felt that after seven years of boarding school, enough was enough. Which brought Remus back to the present, watching James through the phone box door, talking to his girlfriend, who he'd literally said goodbye to eight hours earlier. So unfair, him making us race down here. As if I could ever beat James hangover free since 73 Potter, Remus grumbled. And it was unsportsmanlike. He knows I have a handicap. I thought your hip was better since you got that stuff off Mars, Sirius frowned, making his sunglasses slip down his nose. It is, Remus replied. I meant my smoking. There was a low rumble somewhere in the distance. Sirius sat up, suddenly, ripping off his glasses. Is that? Remus sighed. Sounds like it, yeah. In a few moments, the neighbor's motorbike came streaking through the village, growling all the way. Sirius gazed after it, starstruck. Once it was nothing but a shiny chrome dot in the distance, he leaned back, smiling to himself. Ah, I've missed her. It would be a she, Remus muttered, folding his arms. Potter! Sirius now got up to thump on the phone box door. Get out of there right now! He turned to Remus. Will you cheer the fuck up after you've had your phone call? Yes, Remus said petulantly, looking at his feet. It was another five minutes of goodbyes and speak soons before Remus got his chance. He dialed the number eagerly and coiled the plastic cord round his fingers as he listened to it ring. Yeah? Is that how you answer the phone? Remus! Hiya! Crikey, wasn't expecting you. Do we set something up? Nope. Remus shook his head, grinning madly. i finished school. I can call whenever I like now. Brilliant! He heard some rustling on the other end of the phone and assumed Grant was making himself comfortable. Good. Sirius and James could wait a good long time. So when you coming down to see me, eh? Grant was asking now. Soon, Remus said automatically. He could apparate to Brighton in a matter of seconds, now that the thought struck him, but that would be a tough one to explain. Next week? That would hit the sweet spot between full moons, at least. Working Saturday, Grant replied. On lates at the pub, saving up for a holiday. Uh, August? Oh, um, well, okay, Remus said, a bit disheartened. Sorry, just been waiting for a proper summer holiday in ages, and I'm getting on a plane and everything. No, no, August is fine. Good. I'll remember to get some milk in. So where are you living now? At my friend James's. His parents are really nice. Not moved in with Loverboy, then? He's here, too. Remus explained, knowing it sounded a bit weird. We're going to start looking for somewhere to live soon, though. London, hopefully. He's rich, then, Grant snorted. Should have guessed that. Looks well ill, don't he? I suppose. 
He does. Got that good posture. Oh, let me tell you about this bloke I had round the other night, Grant said, and began a very long, almost unbelievable story about an encounter he'd had with a fisherman. A genuine, honest, to Jesus fisherman, for fuck's sake, who'd done something very odd in Grant's bathtub before making a hasty exit in the early hours of the morning. By the end of it, Remus was hunched over in the phone box, wheezing with laughter, tears streaming down his face. What's so funny? James and Sirius were keen to know when he finally emerged. C couldn't possibly tell you, Remus replied, hiccuping. Muggle humour. Reckon we ought to see how Pete's doing, James asked as they walked back to the house. Ah, you know how he is with hangovers, Sirius replied, dark shades still firmly in place. All right, but we need to make sure not to leave him out, James said, opening the garden gate. I think he's worried about it. Yeah, yeah, Sirius yawned. Oh, I Quidditch? Yeah, James grinned. Just let me change. I'll get a book then. Remus rolled his eyes, though he didn't mind, really. They were going to treat the weekend as a holiday, it had been decided. Real life could start on Monday. The three boys thundered up the stairs, James slamming his bedroom door as he went in search of one of his many Quidditch kits. Sirius and Remus were a little slower. Brighton in August? Remus asked quietly, now that they were alone. Sirius's face lit up and he took off his glasses. You want me to come, then? Yeah, cool. Of course, Remus nodded, reaching the top of the stairs. Hello, boys, Mrs. Potter trilled, coming out of Remus's room. He did a double take at that. He wasn't used to adults going into his bedroom uninvited, even though it really wasn't his room, only a guest room. Hello, Mrs. Potter, he replied politely, hoping to mask his unease. She was carrying a pile of his laundry, which was horribly embarrassing. At St. Edmund's, he'd been doing his own washing since he was ten. I see Sirius was so drunk he ended up at yours, Remus, Mrs. Potter laughed, folding Sirius's jeans over her arm. Honestly, dear, you should have just shoved him out. Oh, Remus felt his ears turning bright red as he gaped at her from the landing. Actually, Sirius came up the stairs after him, Remus and I prefer sharing, if that's... Um, well, we just prefer to, okay? Mrs. Potter looked at him, then at Remus, who was still blushing, but managed to splutter. Yeah? Well, if you like, she nodded slowly. I suppose the bed's big enough for two. Whatever makes you happy, dears. She patted Remus gently on the shoulder and kissed Sirius's cheek as she passed him on the way down the stairs. And that was pretty much that. Wednesday, 5th of July, 1978. They were permitted a longer holiday than expected. Two days longer, in fact. The invitations came late Tuesday night, a note each from Dumbledore requesting their presence at a secret location known only to James's father, reachable only by portkey. The notes vanished as soon as they'd been read, simply dissolving away in their hands. They'd all been expecting something like it, but Remus was surprised how nervous he suddenly grew. He was not the only one. He and Sirius dressed for bed in silence, and as soon as they were under the covers, Sirius was clinging to him, face buried under Remus's arm. "'Tell me something,' he mumbled thickly. "'Anything.' "'I'm really scared about tomorrow,' Remus whispered. "'It feels so real now. But I think it's normal to be scared. I think anyone would be.' Sirius made a discontented sort of grunt. Remus squeezed him and tried a different tack. "'But do you know what scares me more?' Hmm. The fact that we're planning to move in together and neither of us can cook. Sirius began to laugh, and eventually they must have both fallen asleep properly. When they woke up, they were still wound round each other. Sweat had gathered where their bare skin pressed together, and Remus had wide red patches all over, until he'd showered. It was a bit of a walk to the port quay, which turned out to be a bright yellow rubber duck left in some long grass at the end of one of the fields surrounding the village. Remus didn't mind. He liked stretching his legs, now it didn't hurt so much. Can't believe we're only a few miles from London, he marvelled, looking up at the cloudless summer sky, the rolling green hillsides. Garden of England, James grinned. Fleamont solemnly held out the duck for all of them to put their hands on. You all got wands? he asked sharply, and they nodded, swallowing hard. Peter was sweating and looked faintly ill. Remus hoped he wouldn't throw up until they'd arrived wherever they were going. They all touched the duck, and suddenly found themselves whirling through space and time at an incredible rate. 
It was worse than apparating, but better than flu powder, Remus decided. Moments later, all five of them landed in a very small, chintzy living room. The carpet was thick, soft pink, the sofas an ugly yellowish cream fake leather, and the wallpaper a hideous floral design with metallic streaks that caught the light. Fleamont? A tall, thin, red-haired man entered as they were picking themselves up. Remus had only narrowly missed landing on the glass coffee table, which was adorned with a bowl of soapy-smelling potpourri. "'Arthur!' James's father replied cheerfully, reaching out to shake the man's hand. "'Sorry, Monty,' Arthur raised a finger. "'But Moody would never forgive me if I didn't follow protocol. Now, let me see. What was the nature of the last owl I sent you?' It was a thank you card, Mr. Potter replied promptly. Effie sent Molly a few of James's old things for Bill and Charlie. Lovely, Arthur smiled and finally returned Mr. Potter's handshake. Boys, you remember Arthur Weasley, Fleamont said, ushering them all forward to shake the man's hand too. This is my boy James, Sirius, Peter Pettigrew, and Remus Lupin. Hello there. What's this? Arthur was looking at the duck port key which Remus was still clutching. Uh, a rubber duck, Remus replied, looking down at it. I see, I see. And what's it for? Arthur advanced on him, peering down at the yellow plastic toy with earnest curiosity. Uh, it's just a rubber duck, Remus shrugged. Do you want it? He held it out. Arthur beamed at him, taking it. Better not tell Molly. She thinks I'm mad already. Remus smiled politely, privately thinking that Molly must be right. How is Molly? Fleamont asked. And the boys? Twins, did I hear? Yes, three months old now, Arthur replied happily. I did wonder if we ought to stop at five, but Molly's keen to try for a girl. Poor thing's rather outnumbered as things are. As he spoke, he led them out of the hyper-feminine living room, down a narrow hall and into a tiny kitchen, which had a conservatory built on the back. Frank and Alice were in the kitchen, lining up a queue of mugs on the coffee table. Hello, Alice smiled. Tea? She took everyone's orders while Frank divided up tea leaves and various teapots, and they were all told to go through the conservatory for the meeting. Whose house is this, Dad? James asked. Best we don't know too much, Mr. Potter replied. Come on, now they'll all be waiting. After the shadowy gloom of the narrow 1930s kitchen, the conservatory was blindingly bright and extremely warm. It had a clean terracotta tile floor covered with a homespun rag rug. The surrounding windows were glass and displayed an immaculately kept garden which had a double swing set and a slide. The roof was clear perspex and spattered with old dead leaves left over from winter. There was a strong smell of fertilizer and geranium. Potted plants were darted about the place on shelves and end tables. Remus didn't notice any of these things at first because the room was packed full of people. There must have been twenty or thirty witches and wizards gathered solemnly round a large wooden table, or else standing, or crammed into the wicker garden furniture in the corner. Hagrid loomed largest. Remus had never seen Hagrid anywhere but Hogwarts, which was so big that it sort of compensated for the gamekeeper's gargantuan proportions. In this hot little sunroom, he barely seemed real. There were other recognisable faces. The Pruitt twins, Mad-Eye Moody, Professor Ferox, Ted Tonks, Emmeline Vance, Dorcas Meadows, no Dumbledore, but to Remus's delight, Lily, Mary and Marlene were huddled in one corner, looking awfully young and shy in such a crowd. They greeted the boys with an eager kind of relief. Mary clung to Remus's neck very tightly. You're here, he said surprised. I never was that bright, she smiled ruefully. Remus, Marlene reached for him. This is Danny. A tall man stood just behind her. He had Marlene's smile, her ruddy cheeks, and straw-coloured hair. "'Oh, hello,' Remus nodded, suddenly very shy himself. Sirius took a sideways step closer, so that they were shoulder to shoulder. "'Hi,' Danny said, grinning. He had a fresh scar creeping up from under the collar of his robes, but nothing on his face. Not yet. He extended a hand for Remus to shake. "'I've been looking forward to meeting you. I owe you such a—' "'Danny McKinnon!' James suddenly burst out. Having finally greeted Lily sufficiently, he'd only just caught sight of this awkward meeting. He strode forward. 
Can I just say that you are absolutely, without a doubt, the best beater the cannons have ever had? Danny laughed amiably. Thanks. Oh, I hear you're a bloody good chaser. Is it James Potter? Yes, and I'd love to... Hate to break up the social club, gents, Moody barked. But we've got some business to get down to. That shut everyone up, and they gathered round the table looking very serious. They began with a few introductions. Through one way or another, most people knew each other. When Sirius's name was spoken, there was a bit of a hushed murmuring, but he just stared defiantly back at all of them. Remus was proud of him. Let them all see you could never judge a book by its cover, or a man by his name. After that, someone read minutes from the last meeting. Remus didn't understand any of it. They all seemed to be in a strange, grown-up sort of code, and no one stopped to explain things like they did at school. Lots of names were mentioned, people in various corners of the country who were on their side, or who had gone over to the other side. Various policies were being pushed through the Wizengamot, ways to influence votes, how to convince people to come round to the Order's way of thinking. Remus dared glance over at Sirius, James and Peter, and was relieved to see they were just as puzzled as he was. Then the list of missing was read, and everyone followed that all right. Alice proposed a minute's silence, which they all observed. There were some more updates. Everyone wanted to know what Dumbledore was up to, what progress he'd made. Progress with what, exactly? Remus had no clue. Assignments were also handed out. Frank and Alice needed to be in Angsley every night, next week at 6pm exactly. A man called Shacklebolt had to meet our mutual friend, you know where, on Friday. The Pruitt twins were on the rota for guarding this location or that. Everyone nodded along as Moody singled them out. Finally, Moody called an end to the discussion. Those of you who have to go, go, he said gruffly. I'll send word via the usual channels for our next meeting. Anyone needs to speak to me now, you'll have to wait a bit. He clambered to his feet, hands on the table. Suddenly, the little conservatory was no longer silent and solemn as everyone began chattering with the person next to them, furtively agreeing things, or else just catching up. Remus blinked. That was it? He frowned and looked for Mr. Potter, who was pushing his way round the room to them. Come with me and Hagrid, he said to their group. You two ladies, we'll get you up to speed, eh? Remus relaxed, finally. Thank God for that. It was deeply unpleasant feeling so out of the loop. He felt incredibly young and naive. Not you, lad! Alistair Moody had reached them too, and clapped a chapped, calloused hand on Remus's shoulder. Ferox and I need a word. And you, McKinnon, Daniel, that is, he added to answer Marlene's startled expression. Remus's eyes widened, and he silently pleaded to Sirius for help, only for Ferox to join them all, laughing. Don't look so jumpy, Lupin. I promise we're not going to torture you. Remus laughed weakly, accepting his fate. He and Danny followed Moody and Ferox out of the conservatory back into the house, through the pokey kitchen and along the corridor, up the brown carpeted staircase, which creaked heavily underfoot. They entered a small box room, evidently a child's bedroom. There was a small bed in the corner with a stars and spaceships pattern on the duvet. The furniture was small and painted pale blue, and there were glow-in-the-dark stars on the ceiling. Sit down, chaps, Ferox nodded at the little bed. Danny and Remus obeyed. Moody stood, towering over them both, his electric blue eyeball whirring in its socket. No prizes for guessing what we want to talk about, he said. Remus said nothing, because he didn't think an answer was required, but Danny did. The werewolves. Right, Ferox said, sitting in a small desk, leaning forward on his knees. He was as handsome as he ever had been, in Remus's opinion. Still a broad, amiable man of action. His golden blonde mane of hair was as lustrous as it was when Remus was fourteen, only maybe with some grey streaks now. An old, comfortable warmth bubbled in the pit of Remus's stomach, a crush he had never even recognised at the time, which felt so innocent now. He smiled, finally, feeling a bit more at ease. I'm not sure how I can help, Danny was saying. I never met one until that night. He shuddered slightly. But Lupin here has... Moody said, fixing both eyes on Remus. You have? Danny's eyes flickered over Remus, taking him all in with surprise. Remus knew what Danny saw, obviously. It was what everyone saw. A skinny, gawky eighteen-year-old with a too long neck and scrubby blonde curls and knobbly knees and so many scars. He swallowed, feeling like a stupid kid in a room full of men. 
Yeah, I have, he said, looking at his hands. Two members of Greyback's pack, Livia and Castor. Greyback, Danny said in hushed awe. Bloody hell. Remus isn't new to this sort of operation, Ferox said. He sounded proud, but Remus looked up at him, beseeching, because yes, he was. He was absolutely new to all of this, spying in secret meetings and warfare. He didn't like this feeling. Everyone was expecting a lot. I just talked to them, he said. They don't hurt me because Greyback told them not to, I think. They do everything he says. They're loyal. Like an army, Ferox said, nodding as if he understood. Remus gave him a long stare. No, he said. Like a family. They're a dangerous cult, Moody said sharply. I don't care what we call it. We need to keep an eye on them. Insight. So what do you want us to do? Remus asked, straightening his back. He felt more himself. Ferox was still looking at him, but with real respect now. Yeah, what can we do? Danny asked. Moody's haggard, pitted face curved into a wicked grin. Ever heard of Nocturne Alley? Chapter 152 The War Infiltration Monday, 17th of July, 1978 Remus travelled to Diagon Alley alone for the first time via Muggle Transport. Well, he actually apparated a lot of the way, but caught the tube two stops just to make it look convincing. Moody had forbidden him from using the Potter's Flu connection in case he was followed, and Remus agreed. He entered the alley via the brick wall by the leaky cauldron and headed straight for the pub. Danny was inside, waiting for him, nursing a tumbler of fire whiskey. He smiled sheepishly at Remus. Needed some Dutch courage. Know the feeling, Remus nodded grimly. He ordered the same from the hunchback innkeeper. They moved away from the bar and found a quiet corner. Remus cast Muffliato for good measure. They exchanged pleasantries briefly. Marlene had begun training at St. Mungo's and was enjoying it. Danny wasn't doing much of anything. I've got savings, obviously. I'm not exactly hard up, he sighed. The cannons paid pretty well. I could retire if I wanted. Just didn't expect to this early. Remus didn't know what to say because the idea of having a job at all seemed too distant for him. The older man kept stealing glances at Remus's scars, too. Sorry, he said when he was caught staring. I just, you know, never seen. I know, Remus replied, trying to relax a bit. He swallowed the last of his whiskey and pulled out his cigarette case. It's fine. Do you have... Only one or two, Danny replied. Suppose I'll get more. Oh, in the boy, obviously. His eyes darted round as he said this in case anyone was listening in. Of course, Remus nodded, lighting his cigarette and inhaling desperately. Do you know who did it? What's it matter? It might, Remus shrugged. I think it's important to them, anyway. I think the one who turns you, they have a connection to you afterwards. You might recognise their scent. They might recognise yours. Danny wrinkled up his nose in disgust. How'd you learn all this stuff? Some of it's just experience. Some of it from books. Have you read anything? Nah. Danny looked away. Never been one for reading. At St. Mungo's they said not to bother anyway. Not like there's a cure. No. Remus frowned, somehow bothered by this line of reasoning. No, there's not a cure, but there are still things to learn. It's not just a disease, you know. It's who we are. It's not who I am, Danny said fiercely, his fist clenched on the table. Remus looked away, too, embarrassed. Danny wasn't ready for this, he realised. He was still in denial. Danny raised an arm, signalling for Tom at the bar for another drink. Remus wondered how many he'd already had. It seemed rude to ask. Danny was older than him, had been in the order longer. So, Danny said, businesslike, what's the plan? Go in, ask questions. No, I don't think so, Remus said carefully. God, Danny definitely wasn't ready. I think we need to be more, um, subtle. We want them to know who we are. They'll know who we are the second we walk in. The scent. Ugh. Danny wrinkled his nose again and downed his drink. Look, why don't you just stay here? Remus tried. 
Honestly, I've done this sort of thing before. I'll be fine. I can send you a signal if I get in trouble. Danny shook his head. Promise Ferox and Moody I'd do it. They won't know. I won't tell them, Remus pressed. Really, it's fine. If you're not comfortable, they shouldn't make you... I said I can do it. Danny slammed his fist down on the tabletop. Remus had a strange desire to start growling. It would be so much easier to settle this as wolves. He could just assert himself as the leader, and Danny would have to submit or get a cuff round the ear. He settled for just meeting Danny's eye and holding it sternly. It had the desired effect. Sorry, the Quidditch player said, sighing, tense shoulders now sloping down warily. I'm just wound up, with the moon coming on Thursday. I understand, Remus said evenly. But you've got to keep it together in there, okay? Yeah, okay. Danny nodded. He paused, giving Remus an appraising look. Miles said you were the cleverest kid in her year. Remus felt his ears turn red. Hardly, he said. She trusts you, though. I think I'll better, too. Danny had submitted. Remus straightened his back, a flush of animal pride running through him. Thank you, he nodded. Okay, so they'll know us when we go in. The scent. I know you don't like it, but I swear it's one of the most useful skills you have now, so don't ignore it, all right? It's confusing, though, Danny said, sounding frustrated. Half the time I don't know what it is I can smell. What about me? Remus asked. Could you identify me? Danny looked at him quietly, concentrating. His nostrils twitched slightly. He nodded. Good, Remus said, a bit excited now. He'd never had anyone else to talk to about this before. It's like... it's like something familiar, isn't it? Something you know really well. You'll get better at distinguishing different scents as long as you stop trying to ignore it. I find that if I relax, it's much easier. Hardly any work at all, really. It just comes naturally after a while. Then he remembered something else that Danny ought to know, though he wasn't sure how to phrase it. Um, you might notice that, um, females smell different to, uh, too. Um, more attractive. Right, Danny nodded again, paling a bit. Remus looked down, cleared his throat, and resumed. And the ones I've met, the ones in Greyback's pack, they're strong. They have really powerful magic. They don't even need wands all the time. So it's best not to make a move, because it won't be like dueling. They're hard to predict. Merlin, Danny breathed. Don't worry, Remus said briskly. They won't try to fight us. I don't think they will, anyway. It wouldn't make any sense. They want to recruit us. Danny snorted derisively. Fat chance. Try to be understanding, though, Remus said. Listen to them. We want them to think we're interested, right? Right, of course. Except we're not. Danny was looking at him oddly again. Obviously not, Remus snapped. But we're still there to make friends. We're there to talk, which means first we have to listen. That's not the impression I had from Moody, Danny said. This is reconnaissance, not a peace mission. Well, Moody doesn't know anything about it, Remus said. Danny, listen to me. Stop thinking they're your enemies, because they're not. The one who bit you? He was strong, okay? He ought to be arrested. He ought to be punished. But someone bit him once. And because of that, his whole life changed, and no one looked at him like he was the same person anymore. You understand that, don't you? Danny was staring at the bottom of his empty glass. He didn't answer, but Remus knew he was paying attention. They're like us, Remus said firmly, except they've not been lucky. You and me, we have people who care about us, wanted to keep us safe, who know we're more than just, just monsters. The ones we're about to meet, maybe they never had that. Maybe Greyback was the first person who cared. Person, Danny spat. How can you talk like that? How can you give a toss about what happens to them? How can you be so calm? I've been angry for long enough, Remus replied coolly. Now I'm ready to do something about it. They ordered one more drink, and then they left. Danny said he'd never been to Nocturne Alley before, and, of course, Remus only knew it by sight and scent. The odour of dark magic was still there, 
acrid smoke, sour milk. It was a dim cobbled street with crooked lanes winding off in different directions. The shop windows were dingy and displayed diabolical assortment of dark and dangerous artefacts. The pub was easy to find. The manticore's head had a horrible swinging sign hanging on a bracket outside which bore the image of a manticore's severed head on a platter. The creature had the head of a man, but a thick lion's mane. Its eyes rolled upward, and its mouth gaped in a silent moan of misery. It made Remus shudder. It looked like Farox. He went in first, Danny more than happy to follow, then lead. He pushed the door open, and the moment he crossed the threshold, he caught the scent. It hit him like a wall, igniting him, making every hair stand deliciously on end. Five werewolves. He knew each one before he laid eyes on them. Three gathered round a table in the far corner, two at the bar. There were others there, too. Creatures Remus had heard of but never seen. A vampire, two banshees, a whole gang of goblins. Danny was tense behind him. Remus willed him to calm down. It was obvious. But there was nothing they could do but go in. Remus heard the door bang shut behind them. It was fairly dark inside. The windows covered with threadbare velvet curtains. The mahogany wall panelling and countertops were grimy, covered in a strange sticky dust that glistened in places like glitter. Behind the bar were enormous mirrors covered with shelves and shelves of bottles, each one a different size, shape and colour, glowing in the firelight like a wall of jewels. The fire roared, but it was strangely cool. Remus approached the bar as casually as he could manage. The figure standing behind it was heavily robed, hood pulled low so Remus couldn't see its face. Two fire whiskies, please, he said, instantly regretting the politeness. He spent too much time at the bloody potters. The bartender turned round and reached for a bottle. Remus fumbled in his robes for change. Danny joined him, standing close, looking around himself furtively. The two werewolves at the bar were watching them both. That was to be expected, of course. That was what they wanted. All of part of Moody's plan. Remus and Danny were invaluable to the order, he said. A boy who'd been turned by Greyback himself, who Greyback was interested in, and a man who'd recently been turned, who the others would see as vulnerable. Remus nodded at them carefully. Danny didn't move a muscle, but that was okay. It was clear that Remus was the leader. The other two nodded in return. Remus sensed curiosity, but not danger. He straightened up, more confident. They were male, both roughly the same height, only an inch or so shorter than Remus. One was stocky, with dirty blonde hair, a square jaw, fairly handsome under any other circumstances. The other was one of Greyback's. His hair was shaved close to his skull. He had a thick scar on one cheek and a course of tattoos covering his arms and throat, spiralling moon phases. Glancing over these two men's shoulders, Remus tried to get a read of the other three in the room. Two of them were female, one male, all Greyback's. No Livia or Acasta, which was a relief. The whiskies arrived and Remus knocked his back, maintaining eye contact with the two werewolves at the bar, or at least the one who belonged to Greyback. Danny followed suit. Greyback's man inclined his head slightly, considering, and then extended a hand. He had long, thick fingernails, black with filth. Remus shook it. "'Welcome, brothers,' the man said, shaking Danny's hand too. Danny was visibly horrified by this, but Remus thought it probably just came across as nerves, and who could blame him? I am Gaius. Come and sit with us. Remus glanced back at Danny, who nodded, and they both followed Gaius over to the table in the corner. The seats looked like ancient church pews, and they were just as uncomfortable to sit on. Remus tried to subtly manoeuvre himself beside Danny, but Gaius slipped between them, splitting them up. There was nothing to be done. Remus just hoped that Danny knew when to apparate. The scent of them all gathered together was overwhelming and exciting. Remus felt alert, full of energy, but also safe, almost comfortable. It was no wonder werewolves were so easy to recruit, he thought. People spent their whole lives in search of a feeling like this. It was a feeling he knew well. He'd had it ever since the marauders became animagi. Pack. Family. Home. "'Brothers, sisters,' Gaius was saying. "'This is Jeremy,' he gestured at the fair-haired, handsome man he'd been talking to at the bar. "'And these two are?' 
Daniel, Danny said stiffly. He drank from his glass, eyes darting round. He kept looking at the women, and Remus knew why. Gaius nodded agreeably, then looked at Remus expectantly. Remus Lupin, he replied steadily. The atmosphere shifted. The two women leaned in closer, eyes glittering, teeth bared in what might have passed for a smile. Remus Lupin, Gaius said. The cub who attacked our brother Castor and our sister Livia. I defended myself, Remus said, raising his chin. Any sign of weakness would be exploited. We were under the impression that Remus Lupin had made his choice, one of the women said, her voice low and rasping. I wanted to complete my studies. I've finished school now, Remus said reasonably. I'm exploring my options. The two women continued to glare at him, clearly not believing a word he'd said, but Gaius raised his hand. Our father is forgiving and generous, he said, smiling. He welcomes all his children. Brother, one of the women said, he is not to be trusted. He is Dumbledore's lapdog. He was elevated by Greyback himself, Gaius snapped sharply, turning his head and twitching his left hand, turning the wrist. The woman who'd spoken up went rigid suddenly, eyes wide, as if she was gripped by some enormous pain. So hold your tongue. Gaius said, turning his wrist again. The woman relaxed, breathing hard. They could all hear her heart thumping. Remus felt sick. Gaius smiled round the table. Brothers, he said to the three new recruits. Our father, Fenrir Greyback, welcomes you into his pack. We've been shot out like you. We've been denied shelter, friendship, protection. Our father would return these things to you and much more. How? Remus asked, hoping his voice sounded pleasant and inquisitive. Gaius gave him a look. Remus returned it. It was strange. He knew that the thing to do, the correct thing to do for the mission, for his safety, and for the other werewolves, was to lower his head, to look subservient, stay quiet. He had to get them to trust him. But he couldn't do it. Maybe it was nerves or the strength of their scent and their power so close to him, or maybe it was just that old Lyle Lupin belligerence, but Remus found himself doing exactly the opposite. He held his head higher, taking advantage of how much taller he was than the others, even seated. He made clear eye contact and said, I just wanted to know how Greyback plans to provide us with shelter, friendship, and protection. You will see in time. Well, right, that's really not very convincing, Remus shrugged. Sounds like a lot of promises, but not much of a plan. What do you think? He looked at Danny and Jeremy, the blond man. Danny just stared at Remus, looking appalled. Jeremy, unaware of what was going on, shrugged. I don't care how he does it, as long as he does. I've got nowhere else to go. My folks kicked me out. What if you did have somewhere to go, though? Remus said quickly. What if there was a safe place? And you didn't have to pick any sides in a war. Remus Lupin, you are confused, Gaius said, raising his voice. No such place exists for us. The humans have made it perfectly clear. The... the humans? Remus said carefully, thinking fast. They're in the wrong, I agree with you. The Ministry of Magic needs reforming, but change can only happen if... They are not interested. They are only concerned with murdering our brothers and sisters, locking us up, suppressing the wolf. And what exactly is Greyback going to do about that? Remus persisted. He knew why Danny's pulse was racing, why he kept raising his eyebrows at Remus desperately over Gaius's shoulder, but Remus couldn't think about that now. It sounded like madness pushing Gaius like this when he was clearly giving off danger signs, but it was almost as if Remus couldn't stop himself. When you meet my father, Gaius growled, you will understand. I'd like to meet him, Remus said keenly. Gaius's lips curled. There will be time for that, when you've proved yourselves. He looked at the others. When you have all proved yourselves, you will earn the right to call him father. And how do we do that? Remus asked, leaning forward, keen to keep Gaius's attention on him. 
He knew Danny would never join the werewolves, but this Jeremy kid, he was in real danger. Gaius's whole posture had changed. He seemed larger, his shoulders broader. He frowned at Remus. Three full moons spent with the pack, he said, his eyes blazing with intensity. Great, Remus nodded. Yeah, okay, I'd love to meet him. Can we do that? Can you tell me where... Pain shot through him, excruciating, burning. His bones were melting, his skin was bubbling. He wanted to cry out, but his jaw locked. Gaius's eyes bore into Remus's, furious, and suddenly Remus could hear him, hear Gaius's voice inside his head. Remus Lupin, you are a fool, it purred. My father wishes you to live, but only you. You will be obedient, or I will kill everyone in this room. I will kill... Remus felt a strange, sifting feeling in his mind, and knew what Gaius was doing. He tried to resist, but the pain was such a distraction he didn't have the strength. Gaius alighted on something he'd found. His eyes lit up maliciously. I will kill James Potter and Lily Evans, and Peter, and Marlene and Mary, and... I will kill Sirius Black. A surge of fury rose up in Remus, and it was enough, only just enough, only barely, to break away from Gaius's fierce grip on his mind and body. He roared, lashing out with his arms and legs, because his thoughts were too muddled to do anything else. Shaking his head as if to rid himself of Gaius's wicked voice, he lunged at the other werewolf, forcing him back against the pew, half on top of him, wrapping hands round his throat and squeezing. The other three werewolves, Greyback's werewolves, all tried to move, but Remus was so full of anger and violent emotion he barely needed to think and they were locked in place. Is this what you mean by proving myself, Gaius? he hissed, squeezing harder so that the other man's face was turning red, veins bulging in his temples. Have I earned your fucking respect now? Gaius clawed at Remus desperately, but only when he was beginning to slacken and fade did Remus let go. "'Danny,' he said urgently, "'we have to go.' They had to leave first. They wouldn't be chased out. That would look like they were running away. "'Oh, fuck,' he thought. "'Oh, fuck, why did I do that? "'What was he going to tell Ferox? "'Moody would have his bollocks.' The last thing Remus saw before he and Danny apparated was Jeremy's horrified face. "'Merlin!' Danny yelled as soon as they were away from there. "'What the fuck?' They were in a field, miles and miles outside of London. They were supposed to walk from there to a bus shelter, where Moody would be waiting for a debrief. I'm sorry, Remus panted, shaking his head. I got... I lost my temper. I'll bloody say, Danny ranted. Wouldn't have let you have all that fire whiskey if I knew you were going to flip your shit and try to take on Greyback's whole army, single-handed. It was not his whole army, Remus replied sourly, wiping sweat from his brow. He was still buzzing from the agony Gaius had put him through. And that wasn't a bloody mission, was it? Danny retorted. Subtle, you said. Just listen to him, you said. I realise that wasn't going to work, Remus tried to explain. They're a pack. You have to dominate the leader. You need to show them... You sound like them, Danny said suddenly. What? You! All your special skills crap. You want me to be like that, don't you? No better than a pack animal? A fucking beast? Remus stared at him. He didn't know what to say. He was too giddy. His thoughts were a mess. Look, he said, trembling. Let's just find Moody. Right, Danny agreed, still red-faced. Sooner we do, the better. Sooner we do, sooner I could get away from you. Remus didn't reply, just started walking. His head hurt so much, a migraine building behind his eyes. The bright summer sunshine was like daggers after the gloom of the manticore's head. His mind was running a mile a minute. How would he explain this? How could anyone hear it and trust him ever again? What worried him most was that his first instinct was to lie. Danny was walking faster than him, but then he hadn't just had his mind ripped apart by a... Oh, fuck. Was Danny right? Was Remus just like them, deep down? They reached the bus shelter, long abandoned, covered in yellow pollen and sprayed on graffiti. Moody was waiting, punctual as always. 
He looked at them both, blue eye whirring wildly between them. What went wrong? he asked at once. Remus looked at Danny. Danny looked at Remus, then down at his feet. Remus swallowed and he bit the bullet. I made a mistake, he said. I let my temper get the better of me. Moody looked at him for a long time. He was completely inscrutable, and though Remus knew Moody wasn't actually reading his mind, he knew how that felt now. He felt as though he were being picked apart slowly at the same time. Tell me everything, lad, Moody said finally. Remus did his best. He didn't mention the whiskies. He didn't mention the loss of control he felt even before Gaius had hurt him. He definitely didn't repeat anything Gaius whispered into his brain. He told only the story Danny might have told. And it worked. Sounds like you acted in self-defense, Moody said, business-like, as if this sort of thing happened all the time. I went too far, Remus said. It was easy to be submissive now, to be polite and deferential to someone else. I acted... I behaved badly. I put Danny in danger. Don't be so hard on yourself, Lupin, Moody said, sounding almost kind. You were in a tight spot. You both got out of it. Do you need to see a healer? Do you know what curse it was? It was wordless magic, Remus shook his head. And I'm okay. It wasn't even as bad as a full moon. That was a lie. He could still feel remnants of it. His head throbbed and his nerves were vibrating. But it was going away. Pain often did, or else you just learned to get on top of it. Moody laughed gruffly. Good chap. Right, McKinnon. Anything further? Danny shook his head. He hadn't said much while Remus was explaining himself, only interjected once or twice to confirm that it was the truth. He still didn't look at Remus, and Remus didn't blame him. Moody, if he noticed, didn't comment on this odd atmosphere. He clapped his hands together. Well, then, I'd say we're all right to apparate now. Lupin, I'm coming with you. Got another meeting. McKinnon, you'll be okay to get back somewhere safe? Yeah, no problem, Danny replied, hollow-voiced. See you, and began to walk away, back into the field. Remus looked at Moody. He's angry with me. I don't think we should pair up again like that. You won't, Moody said briskly. Remus's heart sank. So that was it. Moody didn't trust him any more. The aura began to walk in the opposite direction from Danny, across the quiet country road. Remus hurried to keep up. The ground felt weird below his feet, like a sponge. Moody stopped abruptly, having apparently judged the shady copse of trees they were now standing in a suitable place to apparate from. He glanced at Remus. McKinnon can't handle it. That much is clear. We'll have him on communications regarding a safe house. You'll be prepared to go it alone next time? I... What? You showed them who you are today, Moody said, both of his eyes focused on Remus. That's good. That'll get back to the pack. Stir him up. We want Greyback distracted. I'm not sure I understand, Remus frowned. Don't you? Moody raised a bushy eyebrow. I think you're more canny than you let on, Lupin. Right, come on. I've got an appointment with Fleemont. That was that. No more questions. In a matter of seconds, they were back on the potter's back doorstep, answering the identifying questions from Euphemia, and then everything was normal. They were back in reality, surrounded by the gentle, warm familiarity of the kitchen. It was like being jolted from a nightmare, and you just had to keep reminding yourself that everything was okay now. Moody disappeared off toward the potter's study, and James and Sirius came running through the hallway to meet Remus. Sirius looked half mad, and they stood in front of each other for a moment, wide eyes full of words. Finally, Sirius came toward him, enveloping Remus in a hug and burying his face in his neck. You're okay, he whispered. I'm okay, Remus said, fiercely squeezing him back tightly. And he wanted to say it. Oh, God, he really wanted to. But he had no energy left, so he just kissed him, and James was right there, and so was Mrs. Potter. But it was the only thing that Remus knew that could tell Sirius what he needed to tell him. He put the rage away, the terror, the guilt, and the fierce need for revenge. There would be a time for it, but not yet. Chapter 153 The War Home Front Late summer, 1978 He rolled over for the hundredth time, the sheet sticking to his hot skin. He hadn't felt right since the full moon, maybe even since before then. 
He was sleeping only a few hours each night, and now it was almost four o'clock in the morning and he hadn't drifted off yet. Can't sleep? Sirius rolled over too. No, Remus sighed, sitting up. Sorry, I should go in the other room. Please don't, Sirius said, rubbing his eyes. It's fine. I'm up now too. I'll keep you company. I'm not really in the mood to talk. That's okay, I can talk. I'm always in the mood to talk. Remus smiled, though he didn't want to. Bloody black. Go on, then, he murmured, lying back slowly. His back hurt from the last full moon, and he'd rubbed some of Marlene's ointment on there before bed, but it was wearing off already. Sirius rolled over onto his side, stretching an arm over Remus's body and talking sleepily into his ear. I can't wait till tomorrow, he murmured. I can't wait for you to see the flat, finally. I never had anywhere that was just mine before. Me neither, Remus replied, eyes closing. Sirius had bought the flat the week before, while Remus was recovering from the full moon. It had been, of course, an impulse buy, but Remus thought that was okay, really. He'd had too much on his mind to be much help, and it was Sirius's money, after all. It was in London, and a muggle neighbourhood, too. After the Potter's initial surprise at the boy's decision, Fleamont had insisted on ensuring that all of the standard security charms and alarms were in place before they were allowed to move in, so Remus hadn't seen it yet. "'Tell me what it's like,' Remus said, turning into Sirius's body, curling up. He didn't make himself small very often. After all, he was bigger than Sirius, and it seemed silly. But just now, sleep-deprived and filled with anxiety, it felt nice to bury his face in Sirius's nightshirt. "'It's small,' Sirius said, resting his chin on top of Remus's head. "'Just one bedroom, one bathroom, one kitchen.' "'Sounds massive,' Remus replied. He meant it. He'd never imagined living somewhere like that, not in a million years. We can have it however we want. Furniture, wallpaper, anything. I'll leave the interior design up to you. Fine. You can build the bookcases. Bookcases? Remus raised his head. He hadn't thought of that. Yep, bookcases, Sirius replied, a smile on his face. Space for the record collection, too, obviously. And there are some garages nearby I might be able to rent. Oh, we're getting a car? Remus was a bit alarmed by this. He'd only just agreed to keep James's old broom for travel on order-related business. He really didn't fancy learning to drive, too. Not a car, Sirius said evasively. But I was just thinking. I mean, it might be really useful to have another means of transport. There's the tube, Remus said. Buses. London is actually sort of famous for them, you know. Yeah. Have you already bought it? Remus pulled away to see Sirius's face. Uh, Sirius. What? Sirius was grinning mischievously. It's an early birthday present to myself. Your birthday isn't for months. Housewarming, then. I'll get you something, too. Honestly, Remus laughed, wrapping his arms round Sirius again. You're a liability, spoiled brat. Get home, okay? Sirius replied, laughing, his voice muffled by Remus's shoulder. They lay still and quiet for a while, just like that. Remus relaxed a bit, but he still wasn't going to sleep. It would be light soon, surely. Every now and then, he thought he could hear a bird singing in the garden. Wouldn't get that in London. Just rattling milk floats and bin lorries, and buses hissing, and maybe the odd pigeon. He couldn't wait. He held Sirius a little tighter. They'd been hugging a lot lately. Contact seemed vital. It reminded Remus he was human. Everything okay? Sirius asked quietly. Fine, just can't sleep. Still not in the mood to talk about it? No. Okay. Then he moved his head against Remus's shoulder, turning to kiss the softest part of his neck. Sirius's hand slid down Remus's hip slowly. In the mood for anything else? Remus had sort of expected to see his new flat for the first time alone with Sirius. How foolish of him. He'd forgotten that even outside of Hogwarts, Sirius and James came as a pair, and wherever James went, Peter and Lily typically went, so it ended up being the five of them catching the train into London the next morning. Sirius was buzzing with excitement, unable to sit still the whole way. He bounced about the carriage, ran down the escalators at Waterloo, and hopped from foot to foot on the underground platform. 
They were all in muggle clothes, and he was wearing his leather jacket, black jeans, and combat boots. Remus liked to focus on these details, because if they were muggles, they weren't at war today. The flat was off Leicester Square in Chinatown. It was a speedy part of town, but that didn't bother Remus, nor did it seem to concern Sirius. It was crowded and noisy, the smell of Chinese food and cigarettes and open drains permeating the air. The phone boxes were plastered with adverts or escorts, and they passed at least two peep show cinemas. I love London, Remus smiled to himself. Sirius flashed him a grin. They entered their building through a door in the back alley of an off-license, filing in one by one, Peter loudly remarking on how small everything seemed and how strange muggles were. Then up a short flight of stairs where they reached a concrete landing with a bright yellow front door. Number nine. Home, Sirius said as he jammed the key into the lock, beaming at them all. It was small. It was mundane, plainly furnished. It was basic. It was absolutely perfect. They stepped directly into the living room, which was very modern, with no entrance hall. There was a doorway to the left leading through to the kitchen, which was sunny and bright, a little window over the gleaming metal sink. Lily made a beeline for the fridge. She'd very sweetly bought a bottle of sparkling white wine to celebrate with. Remus went back into the living room and down a hallway where there were two doors. One was the bathroom, sixties green tile with pink porcelain fittings. The other was a bedroom. Two suitcases, the clothes they'd packed up and sent ahead, sat side by side by the wardrobe. The bed was already there, neatly made with a maroon blanket and throw. Not a four-poster, no secretive dark hangings just a perfectly normal bed for two. Well, Sirius asked anxiously, entering the room behind him. I know it's really muggleish, but I didn't want to go overboard on the money. It's much easier to protect. Monty even had Moody advising on some of the shield enchantments. It's great, Remus nodded. He was so happy, he just smiled, staring round. It's... There weren't words. Luckily, Sirius was smiling too, watching him. I always know it's good when you don't have something sarcastic to say, he winked. Come on, you barely looked at the living room. Remus followed him back through. Lily was pouring out tumblers of sparkling white wine. We should have got you all proper wine glasses as a present. And they all toasted, cheering loudly. Mate, you've got to show me how that electric oven thing works, James said wide-eyed. And the radar eater. Radiator, Lily rolled her eyes. Honestly, how did you get an acceptable in muggle studies? Peter was looking at the small brick fireplace, which was very out of place in the contemporary living room with its cream carpet and plastic Venetian blinds. Are you on the flu network, then? he asked. Yep, Sirius nodded. For order stuff, obviously. And you lot, Moody's made it untraceable. The whole flat is unplottable, too. Remus couldn't help feeling a bit put out by the fireplace. Even if it was essential, he didn't like the idea that members of the Order had access to their flat at any time, day or night. The thought of Alistair Moody's head appearing in their living room made him shudder. Sirius, still watching Remus's face carefully, gave him a nudge. I got something else, too. He gestured to the couch. They all turned to look. You've got a telephone! James suddenly yelled, almost spilling his drink in excitement as he pointed at the device sitting on an end table by the sofa. Calm down, Lily chastised. A phone? Remus stared at it, amazed. Is it connected? Yes, Sirius said proudly. Just pick it up and dial, so I don't have to hang about outside phone boxes any more. He was cut off because Remus had practically knocked him over, throwing his arms round Sirius and then because after all they were in their own home now, took his head in his hands and kissed him long and hard. Lily and James cheered again, Peter downed his drink and went to pour some more. Do I look okay? Sirius was peering at himself in the bathroom mirror. He kept buttoning and unbuttoning his shirt. Should I wear a tie? No, Remus laughed, standing behind him, pulling on a plain grey t-shirt over his damp hair. Stop fussing, you look fine. Just fine? Sorry, Remus replied deadpan. You look incredible. Thank you, Sirius smiled smugly at him through the mirror. I just don't want to let you down. I've never met anyone's mum before. What about Mrs. Potter? The Potters don't count. They're like my own parents. I don't need to impress them. You'll be standing next to me, Remus shrugged on a cardigan to cover his arms. 
She'll be impressed. Don't do that, Sirius tutted. I bet she thinks the sun shines out your ass. Are you ready? As I'll ever be. They left the bathroom, making their way out of the flat. They'd only been moved in for a week and a half, and there were still boxes everywhere, but it already felt like home to Remus. He loved the jangle of keys in his pocket, the sensation of closing the front door on the world, having a place to himself completely. The cramped Soho flat was nothing like as grand as Hogwarts, but already Remus liked it better than anywhere else he'd ever lived. Grant had put it best. Remus phoned him as soon as he had the chance. A fixed address, eh? Blimey, we have moved up in the world. They apparated from the landing outside, which had become a habit. It was secluded enough that no one would see them. In mere moments they found themselves on a quiet residential road in Cardiff, where it was, of course, just starting to rain. Sorry, I should have warned you. Remus laughed as Sirius yelped and scrambled to yank up his shirt to protect his hair. Welsh summers aren't much better than Scottish ones. They made the short walk to the hospital quickly, and Remus led Sirius to Sparrow Ward with much more confidence than the first time he'd met Hope. He smiled and gave a little wave to the nurse on duty before walking toward the end of the ward to see his mother. The curtain was drawn halfway across, so he peered round it first to check if she was asleep. But no, she was sitting up in bed, flicking through a fashion magazine. He cleared his throat and she looked up. A huge smile spread across her thin face, showing every pearly tooth. Remus! Hi, he said, ducking his head shyly and walking round to greet her. He kissed her lightly on the cheek. He'd done that three times now, having graduated up from her kissing his hand. Progress was slow, but every milestone felt enormous. I was hoping you'd come today. She beamed, clutching his hand and looking him over as he folded himself into the orange plastic chair by her bed. Sorry it's been so long, he apologised. I finished school and then I moved. Um, I've brought someone to meet you. He glanced up at Sirius, still standing just behind the curtain, looking at Hope nervously. Mum? Second time he'd ever said that to her face. This is Sirius Black. Sirius came round and looked at the end of the bed, hands in front of him. He looked like he was trying very hard not to fidget. "'Pleased to meet you, Mrs. Lupin,' he said politely. She didn't correct him on the name, only smiled benignly at him. "'Hello, Sirius. Are you a friend of Remus's from school?' "'That's right,' he nodded. "'Sirius and I live together in London,' Remus said, testing the water. He watched her face, but she was inscrutable. She could be an aura, no problem. Doesn't that sound like fun, she said, glassy-eyed. Your dad used to take me for trips to London. I loved to go on the double-deckers. Ah, she was in the mood to talk about Lyle. These were far from Remus's favourite visits, but he let her talk because it made her seem happy. She started on a long rambling story about all the times Lyle had taken her to London, where they'd seen all the sights, and all of the various other places he'd taken her. Edinburgh, Blackpool, and Aberswith. Remus tried not to listen too hard. He didn't want to start wondering whether Lyle would have taken them both to see these places, if things had been different. Eventually, with Hope showing no sign of stopping, Remus gestured for Sirius to take a seat, and he dragged one over from the next bed, which was empty. As he settled in, Remus noticed the suitcase at the foot of the bed. It wasn't usually there. Was she finally allowed to go home? And I had my first ever curry in a little restaurant in Wembley, she was saying now. We're in Chinatown, Remus said. Lovely. She smiled, though she clearly had no idea where that was. She was growing increasingly childlike, he thought. Must be the medication they had her on. It ought to have been annoying, but it actually helped him empathise with her. And you'll have your exams results soon, will ya? We've had them, Remus replied. I've passed everything. He came top in the school in three subjects, Sirius said out of the blue. History, care of magical creatures, and arithmancy, and top marks and everything else. Remus blushed. That wasn't strictly true. Okay, he'd earned outstanding in most subjects, but he'd only gotten exceeds expectations in Transfiguration. That's my clever boy, she grinned dozily, just like his dad. Are you going somewhere, Mum? Remus asked, still bothered by the suitcase. Oh, yes, 
she nodded, resting her head back against the pile of pillows, propping her up. Yes, I'm off to the hospice tomorrow. Remus's insides turned cold. His throat went dry. No, he thought. I know I need more time. Tomorrow? He choked. She squeezed his hands again, her eyes sharpening. I'm ready, love. It's time. But he didn't know what to say. He thought he might cry, but he didn't want to upset her. Sirius looked confused. He didn't know what that meant. I'm making sure everything's in order, Hope said matter-of-factly, sounding much more mature than usual. If you leave me your address, I'll make sure everything ends up where it ought to. And, of course, the funeral. I've told Gethin you'll to be notified as soon as possible, and that you're set at the front. Don't let them put you at the back like some poor relation. You're my son, and I've no shame at all. Understand? Mum, please. Remus looked away, shocked by how distraught he felt. I'm not... just not yet, okay? Her face softened. She sighed. All right, my darling. I'm sorry. Who the fuck is Gethin? He wanted to shout. How many surprises are waiting for me after you're gone? He'd known this was coming, but it was still the worst news of his life. He couldn't shake the sense of betrayal. They'd only just found each other. Sirius grew uncomfortable in the silence that followed. He didn't understand Hope and Remus's shared inability to say the important things. Sirius could never see why anyone didn't just say what they felt as soon as they felt it. But he respected their privacy and got up. I'm going to get a cup of tea, Remus, he said gently. Would you like one? Remus nodded. Canteen's down the hall, he said, staring at the floor, still holding Hope's hand. I'll meet you there in a minute. Can I get you anything, Miss Lupin? She shook her head. No, thank you, dear. It was lovely to meet ya. He inclined his head gallantly, smiling, politely. God, he could be charming in even the most desperate situations. Then quickly left. Remus let go of Hope's hand and buried his face in his palms. Fuck. Couldn't he just enjoy something for five minutes without a tragedy? He's a very nice young man, Hope said brightly. Yeah, Remus replied, huffing a joyless laugh, rubbing the back of his head nervously. I can see why you like him, she prompted. She wanted the unpleasantness over clearly. Perhaps she wanted to go back to talking about Lyle. Well, he wasn't going to let her. She wasn't the only one who could drop bombshells. He looked at her, trying to meet her eye. Look, there's something I really feel like I ought to explain. Um, uh, about Sirius and me. Hope closed her eyes and with a smile, gently shook her head. It's all right, Carried. She took his hand and patted. I knew the moment I saw the two of you. You, really? Remus stared at her. He'd never talked about this with anyone older than himself before. I've had a feeling for a while. I don't pretend it makes no difference at all, she replied, choosing her words carefully. But it doesn't change who you are, my darling boy. She reached for his hand again and he held it. She stroked his knuckles softly with her thumb. You love him, don't you? I... Remus felt the familiar panic raising at the sound of the word, but as it was just the two of them, and he owed it to her to be honest, he nodded. Yes. And he loves you. I think so. Yes, he does. That's all I need to know, then. She smiled again. She let out a great sigh. Love, it's the only thing you get to take with you, you know. Chapter 154 The War Autumn, 1978 Remus peered over the top of his book through the cafe window to see if there had been any change in the street ahead of him. He looked at the clock on the greasy wall beside him. Five minutes to go, if Pete wasn't running late. Remus looked at his book again. He hadn't really been reading it. He was too distracted. He found himself rarely in the mood for studying these days, between order meetings, strange and half-explained assignments, visiting Hope in the hospice, which he tried to do every other day now. On top of this, Remus and Sirius were learning to look after themselves for the first time. 
After a week of takeaways, Remus admitted defeat and asked to borrow a recipe book from Mrs. Potter. Results had been mixed so far. Sirius, meanwhile, seemed to have reached crisis point at the state of the bathroom and dedicated several evenings to finally learning some cleaning spells. They had a fight over whether or not to get a television. Sirius was bizarrely suspicious of this muggle technology, he couldn't see the point, and then another one over the motorbike. Remus hated everything about it, but most of all the highly dangerous flying charm Sirius was attempting. Other than that, things were going pretty well. Well, as well as anyone could expect. The clock kept ticking. Remus lifted the chipped mug of tea to his lips, drank, then grimaced. Stone cold. He'd been here an hour at least, but it wasn't as if he'd had anywhere else to be. Since the botched mission to Nocturne Alley back in July, Remus had noticed a clear shift in the nature of his missions. He was often paired with Peter, and generally only went on soft assignments, passing on messages, collecting dead port keys. Once or twice he'd been stuck making sandwiches for visitors to the Potters. Meanwhile, James and Sirius's fortunes had taken them in a completely different direction. They both spent much of their time with Frank and Alice, or the Pruitt twins, up to all sorts of interesting things like advanced defence, guard duties, and even one or two midnight raids. Sirius was having the time of his life. Remus was miserable, but not saying so. In other words, business as usual. Finally, Remus looked up and saw movement. It was the end of the working day, and men in smart suits and hats began to fill the pavements. If you looked very closely, you could see that some of these men and women were dressed a little bit less conservatively than the others. It was the end of the day at the Ministry of Magic, too. Remus got up quickly, banging his shins on the orange plastic chair beside him. Hissing through his teeth, he limped slightly on his way out. Outside it was muggy, not sunny, but hot and sticky, headache weather. Thick, queasy storm clouds hung above the grey buildings, and a powerful reek rose up from the café bins, old food putrefying in the unreasonable September heat. Remus hung back a moment, waiting and watching, not wanting to be seen. A tall, handsome young man strode past, wearing black robes and a bottle-green waistcoat. He had sharp cheekbones and platinum hair. Though he was very young, Remus recognised him at once as Lucius Malfoy, the man Narcissa had risked her life to marry. Remus watched him walk up the street, fleetingly commending Sirius's cousin on her excellent taste. "'Oh, hello, Mooney!' Remus jumped. Peter somehow still had the ability to take him by surprise. You almost never saw him coming. "'Christ, Pete, you scared me!' "'Well, if you hadn't been perving on Malfoy's ass, "'Shut up!' Remus was already in a bad mood, and much too sensitive to be teased by Peter Pettigrew, of all people. "'Didn't expect to see you!' Peter was saying, glancing at his pocket watch and tucking it back into his trouser pocket. He was wearing a tweed jacket and a stupid little bowler hat, mustard-coloured. He looked like an off-brand leprechaun. Remus scolded himself internally, ashamed of himself for being jealous of his friend, who, despite only having scooped up a hand of any WTs, had managed to walk into an entry-level position in the Ministry. No bother. "'What do you mean?' Remus frowned. "'I'm on time, aren't I?' Didn't you get Arthur's message? Peter looked up at him innocently. Got cancelled. They sent Caradoc. Oh, Remus pursed his lips. So we can go home, Peter said cheerily. Thank Godric, too. I'm exhausted. Work was mayhem today. I'm rushed off my feet. Right, of course, Remus nodded, his shoulders slumping. He hadn't got out of bed until midday. Then all he'd done was read the papers and smoke and eat half a loaf of bread which Sirius had bought only the morning before. This had been his longest conversation with another human being all day. "'Are you sure they don't need us?' he said hopefully. "'Maybe if we went along anyway.' "'Best not,' Peter shook his head. "'You know what Moody's like about protocol. Anyway, I'm starving. I barely had time for lunch.' "'Really? Want to go and get something at the Leaky Cauldron?' "'Sorry, promised Mum I'd be home. She worries, you know.' "'Oh, of course. Padfoot's at your flat, isn't he?' Yeah, he should be back by now. See you at the next meeting, Mooney. See you. They walked in opposite directions, Peter heading for the nearest flue grate, he still hadn't learned to apparate, Remus for the nearest quiet alley that he could slink into and vanish in peace. He tried to cheer up a bit as he stood outside the door to his flat. He shook himself, attempted to clear his mind, forced a smile. He opened the door. You're back early! Sirius's voice trilled from the kitchen, and that was enough to throw Remus back into his dark mood. It felt like an accusation. 
Mm, he grunted, shutting the door and pulling off his cardigan, the hairs on his arms itching and prickling in the heat. It made his scars raise, too, like barbed wire. What's up? Sirius appeared. He'd showered recently, his hair still gleamed. Something happen? Remus snorted, kicking his shoes off and flinging them under the coffee table. Nothing happened. It got cancelled. Or someone else did it. Doesn't matter anyway, it was just busy work. No, it wasn't, Sirius tutted. Why would Dumbledore give you busy work? Because I can't be trusted to do anything else, because they still want to keep me on side, so I don't go suddenly evil. Mooney! Sirius had his hands on his hips now. Remus sighed and waved a hand. Forget about it. How was your day? It was... busy. Long, Sirius said carefully, obviously not wanting to provoke Remus any further. Uh, the usual stuff, you know. I don't know, Remus muttered. You get to hang around with auras all day. The best I get is worm tail. Don't be like that, Sirius sat beside Remus on the couch. You're doing plenty of useful stuff still, and they sent you on that mission at the beginning of the summer. That was huge. Remus didn't say anything. He hadn't told Sirius what had happened, how he'd lost control yet again, and how Moody clearly didn't trust him any more, and Danny probably hated him. In the pause that followed, Sirius tutted. Look, if you're in a mood, I'd rather just get out of your way. I haven't had a brilliant day either. Fine, Remus said sharply. It wasn't fine. Part of him wanted to grab Sirius for a kiss, pull him into the bedroom, and apologise for being a dick. The other part wanted a full-blown fight with lots of shouting and swearing. Either way, he didn't want Sirius going anywhere. Sirius sighed and got up. Fine, then. He grabbed his keys on the way out. Going to work on the bike, he said. I'll get bread on the way back, seeing as how we've run out again. Remus grunted in response, staring at a hole in his sock rather than meet Sirius's eye. They'd make it up later. They always did. The problem with not being at Hogwarts was that Remus never had any idea where anyone was. He missed the Marauder's map sorely and felt anxious when he pictured Sirius, James and Peter out in the world, facing who knows what. It typified the way he felt about almost everything now that school was over. At Hogwarts, he'd been in control. He'd had a place, a certain status. In the real world, he was nothing and nobody, back to the bottom of the deck. As a mature and educated young man, he knew that he ought to face these new challenges with fortitude, set out to prove his worth like James and Sirius, and even Pete. But Remus didn't. He sulked. After the cancelled mission with Peter, there'd been another long and confusing meeting with the Order, and barely anyone had glanced in Remus's direction. Moody hadn't been there, nor Ferox, so Remus couldn't even go and ask them whether or not there'd been any developments on the Greyback front. It was nice to see the girls. Lily was apprenticing in the Potions Research Department at St. Mungo's, and she and Marlene had made a whole gang of new friends at the hospital. Mary was at Muggle's Secretarial College and, like Remus, had been unimpressed with her assignments in the Order so far. "'Suppose they don't want my mucky blood blowing up anyone's cover?' she rolled her eyes. He snickered. "'Good old Mary.' Since that meeting, Remus had spent much of his time alone. He slept in, listened to the radio, went downstairs to the corner shop to buy fags, and pretended to read. He told Sirius he was researching defensive magic, but he couldn't see the point in studying for no reason. Remus was sprawled on the couch one day doing the crossword in a free paper he'd picked up somewhere. Well, he wasn't so much doing the crossword as trying to write the most imaginative swear words he could think of in the boxes. He was stuck on twelve down. Blank, 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 E, blank, 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 F, when the phone rang. It made him jump. The phone never rang. H uh, hello? He said croakily, realising it was after one o'clock in the afternoon and the first time he'd spoken. Watcher, sweetheart. Grant? Someone else calling you sweetheart, you slag. Remus laughed, grinning from ear to ear. Saki Tosser, how have you been? Here and there. Sorry, I've had a bit of a busy summer. Um, you at home then? Yeah. Brilliant, I'm five minutes away. What? See you soon. The line went dead. Not knowing what else to do and mildly stunned, Remus went to the bathroom quickly to check himself in the mirror. He was wearing a creased t-shirt and threw on a jumper on the floor to cover up his scarred forearms. His hair never seemed to change, no matter what he did, 
so he ran his fingers through the curls and watched them spring back into place. He wished he'd showered when he woke up that morning, but it was too late now. There was a knock at the door and Remus hurried to answer it, pointing his wand at the kettle as he passed the kitchen door to flick it on. His pulse quickened and he realised how excited he was to see someone not involved in the war. He wrenched the door open harder than he needed to so that it nearly slammed into the wall. Aya! Grant stood in the doorway, wide-eyed but grinning, his face round and sunny as it had been at fifteen, chipped tooth and bright clothes and everything else that was right in the world. Hi, Remus breathed, standing back to allow Grant entry. I'm so happy to see you. Blimey, Grant nudged him with his trainer as he came inside. If I'd have known this is a sort of welcome I'd have shown up weeks ago. He stood in the middle of the living room, hands on his hips, staring around it in awe. He let out a low whistle. Done all right for yourself here, eh? Very nice. Yeah, I suppose. Remus rubbed the back of his head. It was a bit messy. Old newspapers and half-empty mugs of tea all over the place, not to mention the overflowing ashtrays. Suddenly he was very embarrassed. What you got a fireplace for? Grant chuckled. Thought these modern flats had all central eating. Mmm, Remus mumbled. Cup of tea? Champion! Remus went into the kitchen and used a bit of wordless magic to hurry it along before bringing the mugs through to the living room, where Grant stood inspecting the bookcase. He looked so well. His clothes were clean and smart. He was even wearing a dress shirt, which had a wide floral collar and cuffs. Remus gave him his tea and did a bit of quick tidying before sitting down. I can't believe you're here, he said. Grant laughed. Me neither, to be honest. Been a long time, eh? How was your holiday? Oh, er. Uh. Grant appeared to be blushing. His ears turned cherry red. That was a bit of a fib. Or I just didn't want to jinx anything. Jinx what? What have you been doing? I, um. Look, don't laugh at me, all right? I've been doing evening classes. You know. Get me O levels. He looked down. That's brilliant, Remus said. Grant looked up at him cautiously as if waiting for the punchline. Better late than never, I suppose. I had my CSE maths exam today over in Russell Square. Bloody difficult, but I reckon I did enough to pass. Fucking Pythagoras was a right tosser, eh? Remus laughed. Well done, though. What brought that on? Want to do some work somewhere other than a pub one day? Grant shrugged. Shagging all them students opened me eyes a bit. Don't want to be a thicko my whole life. You're not thick, Remus said firmly, giving him a stern look. Well, we'll see. Grant waved a hand, shy again. I forget me maths and me English sorted, and I reckon I did okay in English too. You ought to see my spelling. It's miles better. Then I'm up and I can start A-levels in January. I want to do psychology, I think. Psychology? Remus said in awe. Yeah. Grant chuckled. Ricky, that's one of the students I was seeing. He reckoned I'd do better with politics, but to be honest, I'd have ended up here with Trotsky. He was a communist. Trotsky? Ricky. Right. Remus sipped his tea thoughtfully. Everyone was doing things. Everyone had a direction. And here he was, just sitting by and watching, as per usual. Self-hatred rose up inside him. So, how's Sirius? Grant asked politely. He's good. He's just, uh, n he's out just now. Um, uni lecture. Nice. And, uh, your mum? How's she? Dying, Remus grunted. Bummer. Remus practically spat out his tea, laughing. Grant grinned. Oh, did you hear about St. Eddie's? What about it? Remus frowned. Shut down. Last approved school in Britain, apparently. They're all community homes now. What happened to all the boys? Some of them got sent to Borstal. Rest got rehoused. They're knocking it down, putting up flats instead. Good riddance, Remus said darkly. I'll drink to that, Grant snorted, raising his mug of tea. They chatted for a bit longer, reminiscing. Grant wasn't seeing anyone serious and didn't know how much longer he'd be in Brighton. He missed London, but he knew he needed to save up more money if he wanted to move back and make a proper go of it. He was so different than the last time Remus had seen him. Enough about me. What about you? You at uni too? I'm not really doing anything, Remus sighed. It's hard to get a job right now. I've mostly just been here. 
Lucky you've got this set up, eh? Grant gestured round, picking up the cigarette box on the table and shaking it. Remus nodded and took one himself. Yeah, lucky, he said glumly as he lit it. You need to get out more, sweetheart, Grant said, sounding serious. What? Grant tutted, blowing smoke and looking Remus up and down. Look at you, you miserable git. I'm not blind, you know. Cooped up in here feeling sorry for yourself, is it? No, I... Remus, Grant sighed, shaking his head. I'm not being horrible, I'm just saying. Remember when I left St. Edmund's and I lived in that squat? Yeah. Remus wished he could forget that, but it burned in his memory. The dirty mattresses, the bare floorboards, the damp. Thought it was great at first. No more school, no more matron telling me what to do, just me looking out for myself. He shook his head, pursing his lips. I like running away. I done it all the time when I was a kid. Run away from me mum, from me granddad, the prick, from anywhere people tried to keep me in. And the thing is, they always let me. Matron never called the police. Mum never tried to find me. Actually, you were the only person ever tried to track me down. I... Remus hadn't known that. I don't know how you did it, Grant chuckled, scratching his chin. Maybe you've got a magic wand or something, but you found me. Twice. I thought about that a lot over the past year. I just wanted to make sure you were okay. I know you did, Grant said softly. That's what amazed me. Here's this lad, this clever, funny, posho lad, who gives a shit about me when no one ever else did. Made me feel like someone worthwhile. So I thought I'd better do something worthwhile. Remus didn't know what to say. He put his tea down. That's why I wanted to wait till my exams were done before I saw you, Grant continued. Even if I failed a lot, I wanted to tell you I'd done it. I'm trying to be better. You never needed to prove anything to me, Remus said earnestly. I know, Grant nodded. I did it for me, really. I did it because running away and avoiding all that stuff that made me feel like shit was pointless in the end. If you want people to think you're worth it, you've got to start acting like you want it. Remus laughed humorlessly. Sounds like you're already taking psychology. Been reading lots, Grant winked. You get what I'm telling you then? Yes, Remus sighed. Do something worthwhile. Stop moping. Good, Grant said brightly. Because if you're not happy here, I'll switch with you. Nice flat, lots of books, gorgeous boyfriend. Remus laughed again and kicked Grant's shin playfully. Shut up. Never. Anyway, best be off. I've got a train to catch. I'll be popping back in in a month or so, so long as I get my results I need. You will, Remus said confidently. I know you will. Cheers. Give me a ring soon, eh? They hugged at the door and Remus watched him go hopping down the steps two at a time, whistling a pop tune. Remus felt lighter. His cheeks ached from smiling. He closed the door and looked at the messy room. He felt like doing the washing up. Then he might nip out to the shops and get something in for dinner. Sirius had been out all day. He'd like coming home to a proper meal. Tomorrow, Remus would make a proper start on everything else. There was so much to do. Chapter 155. The War. Saturday, 23rd of December, 1978. Jesus Christ, Remus grumbled, opening his sticky eyes. He fumbled on the bedside for his glass of water and found it empty. Aguamenti, he rasped, his wand hand shaking. The glass filled with water and he gulped it down greedily. He rolled on his back, pressing the heels of his hands into his eyes hoping to mitigate the headache threatening to start gnawing on his brain. He turned his head slightly and addressed the lump under the duvet. You awake? There was a sort of a shudder and a grunt. Remus tutted. It was too hot in the bedroom, even for December. He got up and went to the window to crack it open. He pressed his forehead against the cold glass and let the cold air wash over his hot skin. They'd been out at the leaky cauldron the night before, pre-Christmas drinks. The marauders and Lily would be spending Christmas itself at the Potters, but everyone else who was working had finished for the year, and Mary had suggested blowing off some steam away from the older members of the Order of the Phoenix for once. As with most of Mary's ideas, it was brilliant fun. 
Marlene came and brought Yaz, who was visiting the McKinnons because her family didn't do Christmas anyway. Frank and Alice popped in to say hello, and Sirius and James insisted on getting in on every other round. After last orders, those still standing had piled into a taxi back to Remus and Sirius's flat, where there may not have been any milk and bread, but the bar was always fully stocked. Everything else had been a blur after that. Remus had a horrible feeling that he and Lily had started singing muggle Christmas carols at some point. He groaned loudly. Why do you let me drink so much? Oh, don't blame me, Lily suddenly appeared, her fluffy red hair sticking up like a dandelion as she emerged from under the duvet. Remus jumped, whirling round. He wrapped his arms protectively around himself. Fucking hell, Evans, what are you doing here? Couldn't get James to leave, she yawned, and I wasn't going to sleep on the couch. They started building a fort. This is the second time you've shown up in my bedroom unannounced, Evans. People will talk. Remus searched for a t-shirt. Second time I've caught you in your pants, too, she laughed. Oh, get back in, you big Jessie, it's still early. He did, but only because the room was cold now, and he didn't fancy finding out what James and Sirius had done to the living room. T-shirt on, he crawled back under the duvet, and Lily wrapped her arms round his waist, her long hair tickling under his chin, like Sirius's did. He stroked her shoulder. She was so nice and small. Do you reckon if I'd agreed to go out with you in fourth year, this is what our life would be like? he asked conversationally. Oh, God, she groaned, covering her ears with her fingers. Do you have to remind me? He laughed. I don't know why you're embarrassed. I was the oblivious one. I had such a crush on you. Shh, he chuckled. James took weeks to forgive me. I had to swear under truth serum that I had no nefarious intentions towards you. That idiot. I love him. Mm. I'm so glad it's Christmas, she sighed. We all need a break, don't we? Yeah. I'm supposed to be packing today, then at James's parents this evening. Will you be there? Serious, Mike, Remus said. I'm visiting my mother. You know, she's... um, she's in hospice now. Oh, of course. Lily gave him a squeeze. Sorry, love. How is she? I don't think they expected her to make it all the way to Christmas, but she's hanging on. Oh, Remus. Lily sighed sadly. It's fine. Remus pulled away, deciding he might as well get up after all. Right, I need a cup of tea and a ciggy, he said, getting out of bed and pulling his jeans on. Ugh, you two really need to give up smoking, Lily said, sitting up. The duvet stinks. Don't ever tell me you've had a cheeky post-coital fag, Evans, Remus winked, heading for the door. post Oh my god, Remus! He was still smirking to himself when he entered the living room, which looked like a bomb had hit it. The sofa had been moved to the middle of the room for some reason, and the cushions removed. James was fast asleep, sprawled across what looked like a giant cream mattress on the floor. James was curled up at Sirius's feet with one of Remus's jumpers rolled up under his head. Remus edged into the kitchen, flicking the kettle on. Every surface was sticky with something sweet and alcoholic. There were mugs and glasses sitting about, half full, some with half-smoked cigarettes floating in them. Remus grimaced and felt his stomach contract, so he opened a window for air. He really didn't want to be sick if he could help it. Mary had written Merry Christmas Bloody Traitors on the fridge door in cheerful pink lipstick, with three big X kisses below it. She was spending the rest of her Christmas in Jamaica, the first time she'd ever really visited her grandparents' home country. Remus was glad of it. Christmas had never been a good time, as far as the war was concerned, and having Mary as far away from danger as possible made him feel a little bit better. He wasn't thrilled about doing Christmas at the Potters, though he felt guilty for even thinking that. Sirius would never consider spending the holiday anywhere else, so of course Remus would go along with it. And it wasn't anything to do with Mr. and Mrs. Potter, who'd been better to him than any other real family he had. It was the war in the order, and bloody Moody, who was sure to be there too. Is that the kettle? Sirius wailed from the living room. Yep, Remus called back. Two ticks. You're a hero amongst men, Mooney, James said when Remus arrived in the living room with a tray of milky cups of tea. Oh, I know, Remus nodded, sipping from his cup. He perched on the arm of the sofa. The fuck have you done to my furniture? Brilliant, isn't it? Sirius grinned up at him, cross-legged on the gigantic sofa cushion. 
Prongs' idea. We did an engorgement charm. Shall we help you to clean up? Lily asked, padding through from the bedroom. She picked up a cup of tea and sat down next to James, leaning into his shoulder sleepily. Breakfast first, Remus said quickly. Fry up? Fry up, they all agreed in unison. They went to the nearest greasy spoon cafe and ordered full Englishes all round, after which everyone felt much better prepared to face the day. After breakfast, Sirius, Lily and James started work tidying the flat, while Remus, at Sirius's insistence, got himself ready to visit Hope. He didn't wear a suit, that would have been overkill, even at Christmas, but he made an effort, ironing his cleanest granddad shirt and putting on a brown corduroy jacket he'd picked up at a portobello market. He even polished his shoes. Sirius had offered to come with him, but Remus preferred to go alone. It was easiest if he had time to process his interactions with Hope in private, which he hoped Sirius understood. Anyway, no one wanted to be stuck sitting in a building full of dying people two days before Christmas. The hospice itself was on the other side of Cardiff. It didn't feel much different from the hospital, except that the rooms were private and furnished with a bit more care. She had fresh flowers every day now, which was nice. Remus brought a poinsettia because Lily had told him they were Christmassy, and Hope was no longer eating solid food, so chocolates were out. Someone had wound gold and silver tinsel round her bed frame and blue-tacked Christmas cards to the wall. There were so many it looked as if she'd had special festive wallpaper. She said if you came while she was sleeping I was to wake her up straight away, said the cheerful nurse on duty. Thanks, I'll wake her. His mother lay dozing in her big hospital bed. He wondered how tall she was standing up. Quite small, he imagined, based on the pictures he had of her with Lyle and how tiny her hands were. He'd only ever seen her lying down, and now he realised he might never see her any other way. He touched her hand gently, squeezing it with his fingers. Her eyelids fluttered and she frowned, the pain evident in her face. She turned her head and saw him, and her brow smoothed at once. Hello, my darling she said thickly, as if her mouth were full of cotton wool. "'Merry Christmas, Mum,' he said, sitting down. "'Nadele Glawelen,' she said, in neat, earthy Welsh. "'How are you?' "'Better for seeing you,' she smiled. "'I'm so glad you come.' "'Of course,' he said earnestly. "'It's Christmas.' There'd been no talk of his visiting her on Christmas Day itself. They both skirted round the issue, and Remus assumed she wanted to spend it with her real family. She asked now, though. Where will you be? At home with Sirius? It was strange to hear her say his name, with her soft rolling R's. At our friend's parents, he replied. The Potters. You met Mrs. Potter once, she told me. Euphemia. I won't remember, she shook her head. I'd invite you here, but it won't be much fun for you. I'm afraid. Whatever you like, Mum, he said, hoping he didn't sound disappointed. You'll be happier with your friends, she said as if to herself. Mr. Potter knew Lyle, Remus prodded a bit harder, wanting to talk about something more substantial. They worked at the ministry together, and they went to the pub sometimes, and James, their son, he was born in March, same as me. I don't remember, Hope said more forcefully this time. I'm sorry, Remus, I don't. Lyle kept those things separate. It's often better that way. You'll learn. He thought about this. Thought about how little he'd known about his parents for most of his life, and how little he'd known about himself as a result. He thought about Sirius, and how they always fought because Remus wasn't open enough. How much it hurt other people to keep secrets, even when you were trying to protect them. I don't agree, he said simply. I don't think it's good to hide things all the time. "'Well,' Hope said. She looked away and withdrew her hand from his. Remus realised she was annoyed with him. It was an odd sensation and a first for their relationship. He wasn't sure how to react. If he'd known her all his life, then he would know what to do. It would be old hat, bickering with your mum. His temperature rose the more he thought about it. It was all her fault. His stupid, stunted emotions, his complete inability to be comfortable with other people, and here she was, avoiding him. He wanted her attention, and he only knew one way to get it. "'Mrs. Potter, James's mum,' he said. "'She makes the best mince pies ever, and a full Christmas dinner. And she even gets me a present, even though I'm not her kid.' Hope pursed her lips, but still did not look up. "'She sounds nice,' 
she said in a small, tight voice. Remus ploughed on. Yeah, James is really lucky. I'd never even had a proper Christmas until I went to the Potters. Yes, you did. She looked up at him suddenly, and she saw his own anger reflected in her eyes. You did, she said. We had lovely Christmases when you were little. She was staring at him as if he were mad, as if he was the one who was ill, not her. Don't you remember the tree with the gold angel and the nativity set? I thought you'd swallowed baby Jesus one year, but you kept him under your pillow because I'd told you about nasty old King Harrod and you wanted to keep him safe. You were so sweet. And we bought you that hobby horse and the pig farm set. You loved the farm set, the pink little piglets. I was forever finding them in the garden. And the hand puppets and the army tank. Remember your tank? I told Lyle you were too young, but you were a sensitive boy. I didn't like you playing wars, but you loved it. And Daddy used to make it move with his magic, and you'd always chatter away together for hours. She trailed off, clearly upset. Remus gawped at her. I don't remember any of that, Mum, he said. He searched for her hand again and squeezed it. I wished I did, though. It sounds nice. I think about you every year, she said tearfully, voice shaking. Every night I used to light the advent candle and think about you, Remus. And I'd talk about you. I'd tell Sean about you, too. He snapped to attention. She was watching him warily, as though afraid he might lash out. Aware of this, he kept his voice even. Could you tell me a bit about Sean? Hope gnawed her lip. She looked so exhausted from the pain and drugs and fucking cancer that he was starting to feel guilty. But they were almost out of time. She's eight, she said finally. She'll be nine in February. And she's your daughter with... With Gethin? Remus asked, feeling as though all the air had left the room. Hope nodded, closing her eyes. Tears spilled out under her lashes, streaming down her cheeks. I never remarried. Not after Lyle. But I fell in love. I had me Sean. Only Sean. She nodded again. Remus frowned. When I first came to you, the nurse said you were always talking about your kids. I thought you had more than one. I do, she looked at him puzzled, blinking through tears. You and Sean? Oh, he felt dreadful. All this time he thought he was one of Hope's terrible secrets. I've never been ashamed, she said, a note of defiance entering her voice. Not of my lovely boy. Never. Mum, he felt as though he'd been punched in the gut. He was crying, too, all of a sudden, and he squeezed her hand desperately. Come here. She reached out for him, and he got up to sit carefully on the edge of the bed, leaning over so that she could wrap her arms round him. He rested his head on her shoulder, trying not to put too much weight on her frail body, but she was stronger than he gave her credit for, and held him tightly. I'm sorry, Mum, he said, his words muffled by her soft nightgown. She smelled of talcum powder and lavender, and family. She stroked his hair. You've got nothing to be sorry for, sweetheart. I love you. I love you too, he wept. He stayed at the hospice for longer than usual, and by the time he apparated to the potter's front gate, he was exhausted. He felt like laundry that had been wrung out and splayed on a clothesline, weak and bare and empty. James had to question him at the door. It was second nature now. Which film did we see in the summer of 1974? The Great Gatsby, he replied grimly. James saw the look on his face and stepped aside at once. All right, Mooney? he asked, putting a hand on Remus's shoulder. Yeah, Remus nodded, hoping he just looked tired. I don't want to be rude, but would it be all right if I just went to bed? Um, tell your parents I'm really sorry, I'm just... Yeah, yeah, of course, mate, James said eagerly. You go up, I'll tell them you're knackered. Thank you, Remus smiled. He climbed the familiar stairs to bed. He really hoped Mrs. Potter wouldn't mind. He'd be fine in the morning, but just now he wasn't sure if his nerves could handle seeing her. She always hugged him too, and being hugged by one mother today was just about as much as he could take. Of course, it wasn't long before Sirius poked his head round the bedroom door. I'll leave you be if you want, 
he said, carrying in a tray loaded with cheese, pickle, ham, crackers, and, of course, Mrs. Potter's famous mince pies. I just thought you might be peckish. I'm starving, Remus grinned at him. Thank you. Looking very pleased with himself, Sirius crossed the room more confidently and set the tray down on the bed between them. They sat quietly for a while, cross-legged on the duvet cover, Remus eating, Sirius pretending not to watch him. When he finished, Sirius took the tray away and Remus lay down, stretching out his aching limbs. "'Shall I go?' Sirius asked. "'No,' Remus said. "'Just don't expect too much, okay?' "'Okay?' He lay down next to Remus on his back. "'How's the hangover?' Remus asked, remembering the state they'd all been in that morning. "'Fine,' Sirius snorted. "'Evans and her potions. "'Great.' Remus closed his eyes, letting the events of the day settle in his mind. It was good to have Sirius there, he decided. Being alone might be really awful. If only there was a way to express that without having it come out all wrong. I've got a sister, he said finally. She's eight. Wow. Hmm. He reached for Sirius's hand and held it. It took her months to tell me. God knows what else I don't know. I wish we had more time together. Sirius squeezed his hand sympathetically. Remus licked his lips, steeling himself for the next bit. I wish we had more time, but I also... I also wish she would be more open. It really hurts knowing that there are parts of her she keeps private. Oh? Sirius was doing an excellent job of keeping his cool. If Remus hadn't been so sad, it would be comical. Yeah, he said. He turned to look at Sirius. Sirius turned back to look at him. So I'm sorry, Remus said nervously. If I ever made you feel that way. Mooney. It's just I get worried, Remus said quickly. That you won't... If you knew some things... There's nothing you could tell me that would change how I feel, Sirius said. Remus was speechless at that, but it was a good feeling. A happy feeling, even considering the circumstances. He couldn't look at Sirius any more, so he rolled over onto his side. Luckily, Sirius seemed to understand and followed suit, draping an arm across Remus's body. Remus breathed out slowly. The mission I did, back in the summer? It went really badly, he said, feeling the weight already lifting. I thought something bad happened, Sirius said. Go on. I... Do you remember how I got the last time the werewolves were nearby? Like, really pushy and sort of not thinking? That happened again. No one got hurt, but I'm pretty sure Danny thinks I'm dangerously mad now. It didn't happen to him? I think he must have felt it, but we reacted differently. I sort of took charge. Not on purpose, it just felt natural at the time. That makes sense, Sirius said. That's what you do on full moons. We have to let you be the leader. Yeah, I hadn't thought of it like that. So, if no one got hurt, what happened? One of the werewolves tried to attack me, but I overpowered him, Remus said. I was supposed to get information, but all I did was rile them up. What did Moody say about it? He was cryptic. I don't think he was angry. He asked me if I minded going alone next time, without Danny, but he hasn't sent me any other missions, not proper ones, and it's been months. They have to be saving you for something, Sirius said. I know they have to be. James keeps telling Frank and Alice how good you are at defensive magic, and they just say they can't do anything without an order from someone above them. Maybe, Remus sighed. Did he really say you had to go alone next time? He didn't say I had to, just asked if I minded. I don't think there's any other way. Danny won't work with me again, he's too scared. So I suppose... Yeah, it'll just be me next time. Sirius's arm tightened round Remus. I hate that. Remus didn't have a response, and Sirius didn't seem to be looking for one, so they just lay like that quietly for a while until Remus fell asleep. Boxing Day, 1978 as Lily had predicted, Christmas Day 1978 was a welcome break from everyone's troubles. In fact, perhaps because it had been a particularly difficult year, 
Remus always remembered that Christmas as one of the most pleasant and happy that they had together. Mr. and Mrs. Potter were slowing down a bit. Euphemia said she wasn't up to hosting a big party as she usually did, and anyway, the Ministry had warned against large social gatherings. Mr. Potter had to be locked out of his study. James and Sirius stole the key. But he saw the funny side and joined in with festivities wholeheartedly. Remus noted that this year it was really James and Lily who were the hosts. She coordinated most of the cooking and decorating, the card writing, while he made sure that everyone always had a drink, that all of the usual Christmas games were played, and that the house was full of joy at all times. As for presents, it was all the usual fare. Sweets and nuts and candied fruit, new socks and underwear, a pair of pyjamas from Lily as a joke, so I can stop catching you in your knickers, and a shiny new pair of Doc Martens from Sirius. Surprisingly, Remus also received a gift from Grant that year, and felt guilty for not getting him one in return. He laughed when he opened it. A Filofax organiser. Grant had written his own address and phone number in the first page, and in the back where the notes were had been written the heading, New Year's Resolutions Number 1. Stop and Smell the Roses. Christmas Day done and over with, James and Lily were heading to the Evanses for Boxing Day. James was absolutely dreading it, having met Lily's sister twice already and failed to impress her either time. So Sirius and Remus went back to their own home to settle in and get ready for New Year. Sirius rather liked the idea of hosting his own party, and Remus was prepared to give in as long as they only invited people they knew. How many do you reckon we can fit into this flat anyway? Remus asked as they opened the door. It's not like we have a ballroom, there's only one sofa. We ought to just knock through the kitchen, have it all open plan. Sirius replied as they walked in. The phone was ringing and he went to answer it. Hello? He frowned and held the phone out for Remus. For you, I think. Remus took the receiver from him. Of course it was for him. Sirius didn't know anyone who could use a telephone. Hello? 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 Is this Remus Lupin? It was a man with a deep voice and a broad Welsh accent. Remus's insides went cold, and he sat down on the arm of the couch, steadying himself. Yeah, that's right. Ah, good. Ah, my name's Gethin Rees. Remus swallowed and found his throat dry. Is, is she? She's gone, isn't she? There was a long quiet on the other end of the phone, and Remus began to cry. Finally, Gethin spoke, his own voice sounding very rough. I'm sorry, lad. Funeral's next Wednesday. Wednesday, 3rd of January, 1979. Remus sighed, staring out their bedroom window, watching the raindrops sliding down the glass. When he was a little boy and it rained, he would sit on the biggest window sill he could find at St. Edmund's and pick two droplets, then pretend they were racing to the bottom of the pane, an idea he got from a poem. Maybe one hope had read him, which he'd forgotten now. It always rained at funerals in films. That was called Pathetic Fallacy. Remus had read about it in an old A-level to English textbook. Of course, if you had a funeral in Wales in January, the chances of rain were extremely high too. It was a strange thing to be glad about, but it seemed proper. A sunny day would have been intolerable. Ready? Sirius asked very gently, entering the room. Remus looked up at him, feeling numb, and nodded. Sirius looked gorgeous in a black suit, his hair tied back. Remus felt scruffy. Though they were dressed identically, Sirius just wore clothes better. Remus had wanted to cut his hair short, to make it look tidier, but he'd been convinced not to in the end. Still, the urge to do something drastic was there. "'Take your time,' Sirius said. "'We've got an hour or so.' Remus nodded again. The service was supposed to start at eleven, but Gethin had said that if he wanted to come early and greet the mourners, he was welcome to. Remus still wasn't sure. Sirius closed the bedroom door and came to sit next to him. He held his hand and stared out of the window, too. "'Have you ever been to a funeral before?' Remus asked finally. "'Uncle Alphard's,' Sirius replied. "'I was really little, though. Nine or ten. Don't remember it. I've never lost anyone close.' Hmm. Remus inclined his head, still watching the raindrops against the grey sky. "'I don't know if I knew Hope all that well.' I didn't even know her for a whole year. I don't think that matters. Nor do I. Remus bowed his head. He wasn't going to cry again. He didn't think he could. 
It had felt good at first, a big rush of emotion, but since then, nothing. Just a blankness, an empty feeling he hadn't felt before. Sirius gripped his hand again. I'll be with you the whole time. Remus looked at him and smiled weakly. Thank you. Okay, I think I'm ready. He stood up, finally whirring into action. Oh, shit, he said, slapping his forehead. The flowers, Padfoot, I forgot to pick up the bloody flowers. Sirius put a hand on his shoulders. I got Wormtail to do it. He's got them. And Lily's got the address for the church, so we won't get lost. Prongs has the food for the wake. His mum set along some pork pies and sausage rolls. And I've got the umbrella sorted. All you need to do is apparate. Everything else is taken care of, all right? Overwhelmed, Remus grabbed him and hugged him tightly. Thank you, he said. Sirius hugged him back. Anything for our Mooney, eh? Remus smiled, breathing in Sirius's hair, his scent, letting it anchor him. The words popped into his head almost out of nowhere, and finally, finally, it was easy to say. Sirius? he whispered, still holding on. Yeah. Love you. Sirius kissed his cheek, puffing a soft laugh, which sounded like relief. Love you too. They walked into the living room hand in hand. James and Peter were also in suits, and Lily in a simple black dress, her usually vibrant hair neatly tied back in a bun. She was carrying an enormous bouquet of flowers. They all gave Remus cautious, sympathetic smiles, which he was getting used to now. He nodded at them all gratefully. Right, Sirius said, taking charge. Let's do this. It was a small village church just outside of Hope's hometown. It was where she'd been christened, and if she had married a muggle, it was where the wedding would have been. Remus knew from their brief conversations that Hope had not been particularly religious, but that her family belonged to the Church of Wales, so she went along for tradition's sake. It was a very pretty building, or at least it would have been if it wasn't raining so hard. Soft grey granite, with a bell tower and a pointed steeple. Simple, but pretty stained glass windows. Like a church in a picture book. The graveyard was full of ancient tombstones and stone crosses, but Hope would be cremated, as per her wishes. The marauders and Lily approached slowly, walking up the sodden pathway to join the cluster of mourners gathered in the doorway. Remus spotted Gethin straight away, standing just inside the porch, shaking hands with each attendee as they entered. He was a tall man like Lyle, but not as spindly. He had dark hair, thick black eyebrows, and rather a weak chin. He looked completely broken, and Remus was instantly less nervous about meeting him. Lily, James, and Peter hung back, looking for somewhere to put all the food they'd brought for the wake, which was supposed to be in the church hall round the back. Remus and Sirius silently waited their turn to go in. Hello, Gethin said, barely looking up as Remus approached. Thank you for coming. I'm Remus, Remus said, shaking the proffered hand. Gethin looked up once, blinking. They were about eye level. Remus. Gethin shook his head weakly, his dark eyes raking Remus over. Hope talked about you all the time. It's a shame we're meeting like this. Yes, Remus nodded. They stood awkwardly for a while, just looking at each other, before Gethin came to his senses. Go on, he said, gesturing. Your mum was keen on you sitting in the front row, but it's up to you. Thanks, Remus nodded again. See you after. Gethin patted his shoulder. Yeah, good, Remus said, aware that he was speaking in single syllables. In the end, Sirius had to nudge him into the church as he seemed to have forgotten how to move. They made their way slowly to the front and sat down. Remus could hear people whispering about him. A few of them knew who he was and their reaction was mixed. He ignored it. He was there for hope and no one else. The service itself was a blur and he barely listened. He just stared at the eagle-shaped lectern and tried to conjure up a decent memory of his mother. They didn't sing a hymn. They played a Joni Mitchell song instead. Hope had never mentioned Joni Mitchell to Remus, but he supposed it must have meant something to her. That was a painful thought. They'd had so little time. It wasn't fair. Sean was there too, of course. Remus recognised her at once. She was the only child present. She was dressed in a cream-coloured frock with a black satin sash, and kept her head buried in the lap of an old woman Remus didn't know. He assumed that was Gethin's mother, Sean's grandmother. She cried all the way through, and for some reason that was comforting to Remus. Hope must have been a wonderful mother. Afterwards, Remus's legs felt like lead. 
He was rooted to the spot. He didn't get up with the rest of the family to walk out. There was no coffin to follow. Her body was already at the crematorium, apparently, but waited behind for the church to clear. Sirius waited with him. When the church was all but empty, Sirius whispered, You okay? Remus nodded. Sirius touched his knee lightly, but no more than that. That was really sad. It's okay if you're tired and want to go home. No, it's fine, Remus shook his head. I ought to go. I told Gethin I would. Just five more minutes? They had to leave eventually. The caretaker wanted to tidy up. The church hall was very small and crammed full of people and people's emotions. Some of them were laughing, reminiscing. Others were still red-nosed and sombre. It was a drab little room which needed refurbishing. The wooden floorboards were splintered in places. There were notice boards dedicated to drawings by the children who'd attended Sunday school there, and another one for the local scout troop. Three trestle tables were groaning under the weight of the food people had brought. Piles of sandwiches, meat pies, crisps, cheese and pineapple skewers, fruit cake, leftover turkey, curry, slices of ham and other cold cuts. It was a dry funeral, and an old lady in the corner was serving weak cups of milky tea. For once in his life, Remus wasn't hungry. Worst of all, there was a table covered in framed photographs and albums. Most of them were of Hope, and apart from one or two snaps of her as a little girl, not one of them had been taken before 1965. Remus looked at them all, tried to fix the image in his head. A happy, healthy woman who'd always tried to do what was best, even when other people let her down. She'd be glad you came. Gethin appeared beside him. He reached out and stroked the glass on one of the photo frames. Hope's black and white face beamed out at him, static and lifeless. I had to, Remus said quietly. Sirius stood at his other shoulder, ready for anything. Remus looked at Gethin. I wish I'd been there for... Well, to say goodbye. It was very quiet, like she was, the older man said. She was awake on Christmas morning and went to sleep right after lunch. There was no pain. Remus hadn't thought about her being in pain. He wished Gethin hadn't put it in his head. I know what you're thinking, Gethin said, nodding at the photo display. No pictures of you. It wasn't deliberate. She put them all in a box for me to send to you. Only I've lost track of your address. I don't want them, Remus shook his head. Remus? Sirius said softly. Don't make any decisions just yet. Remus just shrugged. There are other bits, Gethin said, eyeing Sirius with some confusion, then looking at Remus again. I'll hang on to them as long as you like. Bits? Remus looked at him blankly. Things she wanted you to have, Gethin said. Not money or anything. I'm not interested in money, Remus said sharply. Gethin frowned. He looked hurt. His eyes were rimmed red, dark rings under them, like smudges of coal dust. Remus pursed his lips and took a step back, shaking his head. I'm sorry, I can't be here. I'm sorry. And with that, he turned and walked straight out of the hall. It stopped raining by now, but the grass was still wet, and the scent of delicious earth was rising all round. There was a group of old men sitting on some benches outside. They'd loosened their ties and sat slouched, smoking and passing round an illicit flask of something very strong-smelling. Remus tutted, disgusted, and kept walking, wanting to get away from everything. Remus! Sirius came jogging up the path to catch him. Lily, James, and Peter not far behind. I want to go, Remus said. You can come back to Mum and Dad's if you want, James suggested. Mum said she'll do us dinner. No! Remus shook his head. He grabbed Sirius's arm and looked at him imploringly. Please, can we just go back to the flat? Just you and me. Of course we can. Sirius put his own calm hand over Remus's desperate one, and Remus felt his heart began to steady. So that's what they did, Remus promising himself that he would apologise to the Potters and his friends another time. But if he'd been hoping for a respite from the rest of the world, to lock himself away with Sirius and pretend that just for a moment nothing else mattered then he was in for a disappointment. There was an owl sitting on top of the mantelpiece when they got in, with a note tied to its scaly leg. Remus, my condolences. Please meet me at the Oro's office at 9am on Monday. A. Moody.